sorry. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Hello. Yeah. Glad to see everyone. Let's all stand and worship the Lord together. It's a beautiful day. And last, last Sunday we have learned what is the message last Sunday? Joy. How to supersize our joy. Yes. yes. And today we are we, we will worship the source, the giver of joy. Amen? Amen. 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 So let's turn our let's fix our attention to the screen and let's uh, read Psalm 30 verses 11 to 2, 11 to 12, and let, let's read all together. You have turned my mourning into joyful dancing. You have taken away my clothes of mourning and clothed me with joy, that I might sing praises to you and not be sad. O Lord my God, I will give you thanks forever. Amen. Amen. We won't be silent because we cannot contain the joy that we have in praising God. Amen. Amen.
Glad to see everyone and let's welcome one another as we worship Him. Amen. Let's go around and say hi to everyone.
song 23, we want to share this song to you. That truly, goodness, love, and mercy be upon us every day of our lives. The Lord is our shepherd, and we shall not want.
you are always there in our side, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your promise, Lord, of salvation. Thank you, Lord, for the hope of God. Oh, my Savior, God, to be. 
to be ushered into your family. God, we thank you. We honor you. We, we wish to love you with our lives. You are awesome and you are your faith. In your mighty name. Well, good morning once again. This is Pastor Jim. I'm back with you for a second time. Uh, I didn't do too bad, I guess, last time. Some of you came back, so that's really, really good. So, praise the Lord. Our, our theme today is, of course, sports. And I think a great way to tee up what we're going to talk about in the sermon is to have communion. This time, you'll be able to examine yourselves and ask yourself the question, am I MVP material in the, the Team Jesus? So... Take a moment, please, as you concentrate on the Lord's Supper. If you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, uh, you're welcome to come. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, please abstain, because this is only for those who put their personal faith in Jesus Christ. Now, if you want to have Jesus in their heart, talk to someone after the service, and we can make sure that next time you have communion, you can partake. But if you have the Lord Jesus in your life, you can come. The second thing is, if you do have the Lord Jesus in your heart, I always say this at communion time, make sure that you examine yourself and you ask yourself the question, have I been a good player for Christ? Have I been a good soldier? Have I been a good worker in the field for Christ? And this is your time to bow your head and close your eyes and to confess your sins. Because the Bible says very clearly, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you. Jesus Christ wants you to be in a right relationship with him. So do not go any further. Take some time, please. Close your eyes and bow your heads. We're going to take about 30 seconds. And you're going to ask the Lord, is there anything, Lord, Holy Spirit, that I need to confess? And then confess it. Don't just hear it and say, oh, yeah, I, I know about that, but I, I won't go any further. You have to confess it. Because if you take this in an unworthy manner, that means sin in your life, knowingly sin and being rebellious, this will not be good. So you need to make sure that you confess your sins and ask the Lord to forgive you. So let's do that. First Corinthians 11 tells us, For the, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are doing we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home, so that when they meet together, it will not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give you further directions. On that night, the Lord Jesus had his disciples around him, and he demonstrated to them true love. 
by going to the cross. And he said, you need to remember this. And that's why we do this. We don't do it just because we have to, someone tells us. We do it because we want to. Because we want to remember what the act of love that Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. So, if I could have my two brothers come up. Great. Austin and Kevin. Eh? <laughs> All right, so uh, the Lord Jesus on that night took bread. And when he had taken the bread, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Jesus Christ had to go to the cross and all the terrible things he went through. And yet he thought of us, not himself. Truly a servant, as it says in Isaiah. He suffered so much. Not only the physical pain, but also the pain of enduring all the sins of the world on him. Terrible, terrible things. Someone so innocent and clean. What a travesty. But what a joy for us. Because we result in that blessing through Christ. So I'm going to ask Brother Austin to pray for the bread. Yes, God. Let this be a time where we remember. And a time where we are reminded of your power. Your cleansing and your healing power. Remember, as your flesh was torn, we are healed. Mm. And as, you are, uh, as you went up on that cross, Lord, we found redemption and salvation. And so, Lord, may we never forget. May we understand the gravity and the weight of your pain and your suffering, Lord, so that when we partake in this bread, Lord, uh, remember, you remember the price for our salvation and our redemption. So the brothers will now pass out the bread and please hold it and then we'll go with the juice and we'll pass that out and then together uh, we will take communion. Then after supper, Jesus took the cup, the new covenant, something better. The scriptures say, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Jesus had to shed his blood. But why his blood? Couldn't any man have gone to the cross? No, there is no one, no one like Jesus Christ, giving himself up for us, the perfect sacrifice. And the scripture says it had to be the perfect sacrifice. So when we think of the Passover as new meaning, the perfect lamb without blemish, Jesus Christ is that one. And he gives it freely to us who follow him. And so we're going to hand up the cup now, and we're going to ask Brother Kevin to pray over the cup. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior. Lord, we thank you for his blood spilled from the cross. Only through his blood do we have redemption, and we have forgiveness of our sins. Lord, in the Old Testament, we offer sacrifices after sacrifice. 
but it can never pay for the sins committed against you, Father. Only the holy and righteous, your Lord and Savior, our Lord and Savior, can pay for that. Only his blood spilled on that cross and paid for every sin, every iniquity, anything, every sin that was committed against you, Father. Lord, we are humbled in your presence. We will have such a gift as this. Lord, may we celebrate this. Give thanks right now. It is the glory of you right now. We thank you for what you have done for us. To may the praise be to you, for Jesus, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Once again, please wait until we can take it together. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. We are nothing compared to Him. And in Him we are everything. It's a wonderful gift. He took all the pain, we get all the gain. Remembering Jesus. The bread first. Now that we've had our time to get right with the Lord, maybe in the past you have struggled with your performance. Maybe it's time for a comeback. Let's watch the video.
Here comes a comeback Just cause you're late though Got up slow from the city Don't mean you fight though Or fight off your enemy Just when they think there's nothing Left running on empty Oh, oh, oh Here comes a comeback This is your second Chapter 2, verses 19 to 30. Oh, children. Yeah. Sorry, children. You can go now. Sorry. Go. You know, in professional sports, we have a lot of Team Jesus players. For instance, Steph Curry. He is a born again Christian. 2015 MVP, plays for the Golden State Warriors. He holds the record for three-pointers. He's an outspoken Christian for Jesus. Kevin Durant, KD, he also is a born-again Christian. As a matter of fact, Kevin Durant carries a Bible in his backpack wherever he goes, and he's seen actually reading it in public, and if someone else wants to hear him read the Bible to them, he reads the Bible to them. Kevin Durant, yes, Golden State Warriors. Russell Wilson, quarterback, Seahawks. Anybody a Seahawks fan? Yeah? Okay, right on. So he is also a Christian. Bubba Watson, a golfer. He, when he won the, uh, the Masters, he said, I'd rather like to thank Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Some pretty amazing names on Team Jesus. Today, I don't know about you, but I see Paul in the passage as the coach. And I see Jesus Christ is the owner of Team Jesus. And if you know Christ as your Savior, you are on Team Jesus. Right. And you have, the, you have the ability through the Holy Spirit to become an MVP, a most valuable player. Isn't that what it's all about? It's helping serve Jesus and making him smile so that one day when he comes back, he says, Well done, 
My good and faithful player, servant, MVP. Growing up, I loved sports. I never thought God could use me because all I could do is play sports. I knew half of John 3.16, that was about it, but I loved sports. I played sports in junior high, I played basketball, football. High school, I played basketball, football, I ran track. In college, I played basketball. I just couldn't get enough sports. And then I realized that sports were training me, after I accepted Jesus, to be a better team player. Because I don't know about you, you probably played sports, but there are a couple of guys and persons who were prima donnas. They would keep the ball to themselves, you pass them the ball, and they would shoot. They wouldn't pass. You just pass them the ball, they would shoot. They wouldn't pass. And it was terrible shots they were taking. And it's so frustrating when you're on a team and you got a prima donna who is taking all the shots, and they're terrible shots. Unless you're Steph Curry. You can make it from a half court, no problem. <laughs> it's all about Team Jesus. Glorifying Him. Not making ourselves glorified, but glorifying Him in every way. So I want to get warmed up today. And I don't know if you noticed on your sheets, uh, there are some signs I put there. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And so uh, right here uh, yeah, to there is going to be Go Team, and you, over here is going to be Jesus. Okay, so we're going to have a couple cheers to get you warmed up for this. Ready? So, I want to be loud and proud for Christ. So we're going to start. Go over here. Okay, you guys are going to say, Go Team. Go, go Team. Do you, Jesus people think you can beat that? Okay, try Jesus. Jesus! Ooh, okay. Well, that's oh, really okay. Well, I'll give you another chance. You guys ready? Go, go team. team! All right, a little one more time. Go, go team. team! That's better. Okay, and then... Jesus! Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, now we're going to put it together, right? So when I point to you, you yell. Go, go team. team! Jesus! Go, go team. team! Jesus! Go, go Team! team. Good. Let's read the passage. Verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone looks out for their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son... With his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. Verse 25. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy. That's that word, verse 29, joy, and honor people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. So the two stars of this passage are Timothy and Epaphroditus. Timothy means honoring God or honored by God. Paul met Timothy on his first missionary journey and found out that through uh, his mother and his grandmother, Timothy came to Christ. There did not seem to be a father figure in the family, so Paul kind of took that on. 2 Timothy 1 2, he says to Timothy, my son. Now, on a second missionary journey, Paul takes Timothy with him and he begins the mentoring process in the place of John Mark. So let's pray and ask the Lord to bless this time. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful today that we can be on Team Jesus. And when we give our life to you personally, we pray that you're, you would allow us to bring our A game when we serve you daily. Help us to learn from these two MVPs and be better Team Jesus players than we are now. Holy Spirit, as our divine trainer, help us to do what is best for Team Jesus at Living Word Church. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, 
So this is where it gets really crazy. If you don't want to invite me back next month, that's fine. But uh, if you were at a sporting event, let's say a, a basketball game, this might be how these guys are introduced to you. Good morning, Living Word Church. Put your hands together this morning for the Lord's servant, Timothy. He is originally hails out of Derby, where he studied under the University of Apostle Paul. He stands righteous and blameless in Christ and plays guardian of God's word. Number 19, Timothy! Right on. Thank you. The first thing about Timothy, three things. So it's number one, a team Jesus servant mindset. Remember last week we talked about the Apostle Paul? He had a mindset for Team Jesus as well. Well, Paul recognizes this and Timothy as well. In verse 20, Paul says, Timothy and him were like-minded. The mindset was the same. Do you know that in Romans chapter 16, Paul greets 26 people, but only one of them, Timothy, came to his aid. Only one of them was willing to come and be with Paul in prison. He had a team first mindset. He didn't think of other, himself first, but he thought of others. In a church, in a church that's team Jesus, it's so important to think of others before ourselves because that's how our owner thinks Jesus Christ. He thought first to go into the cross for us. Secondly, Timothy had a conscious thinking of the self second, which goes along with that. In Philippians 2 7, it says, He made himself nothing taking on the very nature of a servant, Jesus Christ. Self is our biggest foe when it comes to being on Team Jesus. When you're past the ball spiritually, do you pass it if there's someone's open, or do you shoot it? Do you block for somebody else if they're coming through the line, or do you say, you know what? I don't have the ball. I'm just going to let them go on their own. And you step aside, and the opposing team hits them. Right at the line of scrimmage. Well, that wasn't very nice. You didn't do your job. Well, you know, I'm, I have more important things to do instead of blocking for somebody. Sometimes we do that in the church. There's no, remember this, there's no I in team. I hated that before. There's no I in team. That's true. Really, but really, there is no I in team. And there is no I in church. All but certain. Because Jesus is our example. Philippians 2.21 says, They all seek their own desires, not the things which are of Jesus Christ. The problem arises when we start thinking of ourselves and not thinking of Team Jesus. He definitely knew who was in charge. Timothy knew that Paul was the coach. Jesus was the owner. When you mix those up, you have problems. Paul and Timothy served their owner, Jesus Christ. Matthew 20, 26 says, He who wishes to be great among you must be the servant of all. Do you know that Steph Curry is a leader in assists? How can this guy score over 35, 40 points a game, make shots from half court, and still be a major contributor to other people's scoring? LeBron James is the same. If you've ever watched him play basketball, you see, man, the guy, he isn't even looking, and he'll throw you a pass. It's a good thing the guys that are getting the pass are looking, <laughs> because it could be bonking off their head or their chest. The mindset is to make everyone else better on the team. In the church, the mindset is to make Jesus Christ look the best he can in the world around us. So we aren't churches that are starving for money or finances. We're churches that give generously. We aren't churches that are, have to hire somebody from out there to do our, our nursery. we got nursery workers in the church. We don't have to limp along. We are the best team in the whole universe. Team Jesus, amen? Amen. So we don't have to do half stuff. We can do full because we are those that are servants and players for Jesus Christ. Ephesians 6, 7 says, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving for the Lord. 2 Timothy 2, 24, and the Lord's servant must be not quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone. In Colossians 3, 24, it is the Lord Jesus you are serving, no one else but him. The second thing about Timothy was Timothy had 
Team Jesus training. He had training at home. Parents, so important. Every chance you get to talk about Jesus. Don't let the TV take over your kids. Don't let the school. You talk to them about who Jesus is. I have four granddaughters. Every night, almost, my wife and I, before we go to bed, we say a prayer. We say, Lord, as long before you, any, anytime soon, you can bring those four little babies to you. Childlike faith. You need to talk about your kids. And Timothy had a mom and a grandmother who were both born-again Christians, and they talked to Timothy. Secondly, he was mentored by Paul. Can you imagine going around telling people, I was mentored by Paul, who was actually with Jesus. Whoa, that is just so cool. That's like that's like in sports. Knock, knock at your door. Steph Curry comes over. you got a basketball hoop in your driveway, and he says, Hey, I'm Steph Curry. I want to teach you how to shoot threes. No, wait a second. Let me call my friend. Steph Curry is here. That's unbelievable. Wow. He was mentored by Paul. Mentoring has been lost over the years. It should be a time where you walk with somebody and we're so busy today and people don't see the, the, the importance. Mentoring is so important because we need to pass on to others the things that we have learned. And those who walk with the Lord, they can share with the ones that are younger. And Titus 2 says older women should be mentored, uh, older women should mentor younger women and older men should mentor younger men. Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron, as one man sharpens another. You know what happened? After he's mentored, he sent him out. Paul says, you know, I can't go there, but Timothy's coming. Timothy began to do the work that Paul was doing. He got the job that Paul was doing. And Timothy could do it, you know why? Because he had a good foundation. He had a good mentor. He had a mentality that says, I want to serve Jesus wherever I am, and Jesus, you said, no. That's like being on a team, and I played football, and I know sometimes guards and tackles got nothing. It's always the running backs. It's the quarterback, the guy that throws a touchdown. Who thinks about the linemen? But I tell you, linemen are very important. If they aren't blocking, those runners aren't going to make any yards. They're going to make deficit. They'll be like minus 300 yards in a game. And you want to get plus. It's the linemen who open the line so the running backs can go through the slots. So no job in the church is not as, as inferior. Every job is important. Whatever you have, your job in here in Team Jesus, it's important. God would not have put you there if it was not important. So just because you don't sing up here and you out there and you may just read or you may shovel the driveway or whatever when it snows, it's important. It's all important on Team Jesus. When I was 27 years old, I was youth pastor at Sunshine Ridge Baptist in, in Surrey on Scott Road, right out of seminary, green behind the ears. My, my pastor, he resigns after six months. And so they said, oh, Jim, you can take over for a while. Oh, oh, yeah, right. So here I am sitting behind this big desk. I can you know, hardly see over it. People come in. Couples, I've been married four years. They're telling me their problems of marriage. Uh, it's like, uh-huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> a long time I'm praying, Lord, give me wisdom. I mean, I don't, I've never heard of this problem before. <laughs> oh, so, you know, my few years of working before and seminary, but it was on the job tree. Mm -hmm. But yet, I had said to the Lord, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I will do for you. Number three, Timothy had a Team Jesus reward coming for his faithfulness. Remember, on Team Jesus, the key is your faithfulness. God will do the rest. He will make the results come, and you'll go, Wow, that, was, that wasn't me. And Jesus said, That's right, but you were there, so I could use you. Don't always look at the results. God looks at your faithfulness of your heart, because he can do the rest. He really doesn't need us, but he uses us so that we can receive a blessing on this Team Jesus. He was rewarded with joy by helping others. God used him by Billy. He was rewarded by serving with the Apostle Paul alongside of him. That must have been pretty amazing to serve next to the Apostle Paul. With all that he went through, his mindset was always one of joy and bringing glory to Jesus Christ. That's the kind of people you want to hang with. Those are my people. I want to hang with those kind of people. I want people who come and they go just say, It's okay, Jim. God's going to take care of this. Hang in there, brother. 
And on Team Jesus, we need those kind of people. And he was rewarded by being a substitute. And oftentimes we don't think of work as a reward, but it is. Because then God gives you all that you need. He gives you the opportunity. And then he gives you the strength to do what you got to do. And after you do a job for Team Jesus, for you, you feel so good. Like, you let me lead that person to Christ. That is amazing. I got to share with two Jehovah's Witnesses on the street the other day. That was awesome. They didn't know what to do with what I was saying. Because the scriptures are real. And they're true. And it's not fake. Like, their doctrine. So can you imagine that God, Jesus calls time out in the world. He says, excuse me, time out. He says, okay, Apostle Paul, you're out of the game. All right, Pastor Jim, you're in. That's like going to an NBA game. I'm sitting there and all of a sudden, whistle blows. Beep. Okay, Steph Curry, you're out. Hey, Jim Calibans, are you here? We hear you play basketball. Oh, there he is, third row. Jim, come on down, get suited up, you're going in for Steph. Yeah, right. Kevin Graham looked down at me, he's going in for Steph? Yeah, he's going in for him. Like, it's pretty amazing that God would use us. But he does. He uses us in amazing ways. And our reward will be eternal. 1 Corinthians 9.25 Everyone who competes in the games does not do it for a crown that will not last, but will do it to get a crown that does last. And I'm sure when Timothy walked through the pearly gates into heaven, good job. All of heaven rejoiced. So the question after talking about Timothy is, are you using your talent for Team Jesus? Are you using your talents for God? One guy uses his talents. Uh, this uh, I heard about this um, cruise ship that uh, wouldn't go. And they were stuck with all these people on it. And so they got all the engineers, the bright young engineers, and they were all looking at it. They couldn't figure out how to get it to go with the engine. So then they called this guy, uh, older gentleman, and uh, they brought him on board, and he had this little bag, and in this bag he had a hammer. And so for 10 minutes he looked at the engine, and he, hmm, hmm, hmm. And then the owner came, and they were watching him, hmm. So he reached in his bag, he grabbed the hammer, and he hit it very gently in a certain spot. And as soon as he hit the engine, it lurched into power, and everything went on. And they were all happy. And the older gentleman came to the owner and said, that will be $10,000. <laughs> and the owner says, you're only there 10 minutes. Give me an itemized invoice. So the next day, he sent him an itemized invoice, and it said this. $2 for the hammer, $9,998 for knowing where to tap. <laughs> <laughs> Timothy was trained to know where to tap spiritually. God will not send us out on a job or get us into the game if we are not trained. We need to make sure that we are trained and using the gifts that God has given us. Timothy had those gifts. Are you willing? to get in the game. Because all of you have gifts. There's not one of you out there that doesn't have a gift. If not many. But you need to put it to work. You need to get off the bench and do the game. Okay, the second person is Epaphrodites. And indulge me one more time. If you were at a sporting event, you might hear this. Brothers and sisters of the Lord at Living Word, put your hands together for the Lord in leading Paul to make his second pick on his list of God-honoring members of Jesus' team. He is out of the town of Philippi, standing tall for the Lord, a charming guy in Christ, who can take a punch from Satan, and still stand in the power of the Lord. The second servant of the Lord, who almost sacrificed it all, number 24, Epaphrodites! That's all. Now, Epaphrodites means one who is charming, or lovely. Actually, it's a pagan origin, and it has to do with the goddess of Aphrodite. But it shows the power of God that he can take from another small g god, someone who is named after that god, and the power of God to bring him to Jesus, the living God over a dead god. He, he was sent to Paul as a care package. Now, my only experience with a care package at Bible college was when I was in Edmonton. 
And uh, I told my mom that I really loved to have some of her homemade chocolate chip cookies. They were like to die for. Her. And so she finally sent me a package. Now, when I opened the package, it looked like somebody from Canada Post had opened it. <laughs> it looked like it. And, and took a rolling pin and rolled over all of my cookies. I was eating crumbs. But I still ate them because they were so good. So then I made the mistake of telling my mother. I said, Mom, you know what happened? Your care package, all the cookies are smashed. She said, I'm never sending you another package again. That was not the response I wanted. But, praise the Lord, God took care of that. He sent me checks instead. So that was really good. So we all know about a care package. It's sent because someone cares. Two, three things about Epaphroditus. Number one, he was a force for Team Jesus in many ways. You might say he went into beast mode. You know, LeBron James, beast mode. Like, I'll watch him play for the Lakers now, and he just takes over. He just dominates. He crashes the boards. He makes shots from outside. He just he goes into beast mode. And that's what Epaphroditus was like. He was like a force for God. And, and, and Paul calls him three things. He, first of all, he calls him his brother in verses 25 to 30. They were, had common things. And on a Team Jesus, we become common with each other because we have the same Holy Spirit. And the joy that Paul had, Epaphrodites had. And these two guys were like buds in Christ. They were, they were having a bromance in Christ. They were, they were close because they, had, they, were, they were brothers. And I know in churches sometimes you can, you can connect with someone so closely that it's, more than, it's even closer than your own biological brother. And that's what was happening here. He was his brother. Secondly, he called him his companion. A companion, of course, is someone that goes along with you and helps you. And through the process, for this short time, Epaphrodites helped him in the advance of the gospel. The third thing he called him was his fellow soldier. Because, you know, as a Christian, we're all in spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6 very clearly tells us that an evil one attacks us. Satan and his, and his enemy and his angels. And so the attack will come upon those who are willing to put their foot forward and to be more involved. Thus, players like KD, Steph Curry, they're double and triple teamed. I don't know how they even get the ball. But you look and there's three guys and one guy. And the other two guys are trying to guard the other four. Like, how is this possible? But when you put yourself out on the line, when you say... Today, team, I'm gonna, I want to be more of a, a force for Team Jesus. I want to go into beast mode. I want to be an MVP candidate. Uh, Satan's going to take notice of that. And your life will not become easier. It will be harder because you're actually doing something. Satan doesn't care about the players on the team that's at the bench. It's the ones in the game that score the points. And if we're scoring for Jesus in the world around us, we want to make sure that we are out there active, and Satan will come after you. But, 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. When Satan comes after you, say, in the name of Jesus, stop. Talk to the hand, because I am one of his. And you can't touch me, because I'm in Jesus Christ. And live on that authority that you have. So, it will be, there will be a war, but Satan will be defeated. And then, number two, Paphrodites was burdened about other Team Jesus members. You cannot be in Team Jesus and not care about others, because then you become one of those uh, players that holds the ball, that doesn't pass it. Because passing the ball means that you value someone else. No, you can't play with my ball. This is my ball. And if you keep pressuring me to pass the ball, I'm taking my ball home. Well, what kind of player is that? It's not a very good player. In a church, when you're a Team Jesus player, you pass the ball. You block so someone can get a good shot. You do all those things that will encourage others because it's not about you. It's about Jesus. Amen. So as you work, you do it as unto Jesus. So whoever you meet in the street this week, you serve them as unto Jesus. It's almost like Jesus was there, or at least Jesus sent them your way. And then you look at them totally different than before. Because before it was all about you. But when you're on Team Jesus, it's all about 
him and them. No I and team. He was concerned about Paul, the long, dangerous journey. He was concerned about his own church and what was going on there and his feelings towards them. He was willing to reach out to gospel and to build this fellowship. Through this process, we need to be more of doers than just takers. You can come on Sunday morning and get all the instruction. I can show you the plays. All right. You're going to block here. You're going to go through there. I remember football practice. We always had the whiteboard. X and O, X and O, X and O. And on paper, it looked good. On paper, like, we're going to win every game. But until you execute the play, you will not win a game. So you need to execute. Be the player that God has called you to be. And number three, and then Epaphrodites was a blessing to other team members, to Jesus. A blessing to Paul. Worsby says it would be a tragedy to go through life and not be a blessing to someone. In our churches today, there are those who just come, sit in the pew, and leave. And they never impact anyone's life. They never throw a block for anybody or throw them a pass or bounce past them the ball so they can score a, a hoop. They just come, take in. Oh, those are great plays. I love the plays in this book. They're amazing. This book is life. I'm going to live by this book. And they never, ever become involved in the team. God is calling you to be part of the team. It's not enough just to say, you know what, I'm a Christian. I don't need to go to church. No, that's totally wrong. Hebrews says very clearly, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is today. But get me together, encourage each other, until Jesus Christ comes back again. The church is to be that well-oiled team. So Epaphrodites was going home. He was a blessing to Paul as time was up. But even Paul here makes sure that he gets a good welcome. Because you know how people are sometimes in churches, they talk. Oh, Epaphrodites couldn't make it. So the last verse, 28, 28, 29, 30. Paul sends a recommendation that will knock your socks off. He says, not only is this man a man of God, but he gave of himself for the cause. And that's what made him the MVP that he was, Epaphroditus. He was a blessing to his own church. He was a blessing to Paul. He was a blessing to everyone that he came in contact with. And really, that's our goal as Christians today, isn't it? To be a blessing. It's going to be a drag. Someone comes to church and oh, I gotta sit next to them. They're such a drag. Oh. <laughs> you know, we smile, but we're thinking that inside. Well, if you're that person who's the drag, you need to find out where is your joy. Do you really know Jesus? And do you really understand that you don't come on this team and sit the bench? You're oh, coach, put me in, put me in, coach, put me in. I can do that. I can do that. You know, if our churches were like that, where someone asks for volunteers and we go. Everybody looks down, sit in their hand, just in case they get a twitch. Their hand won't go up in the air. <laughs> Wouldn't it be so much different in churches if the pastor says, you know what? I need someone to do that. Oh, 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 oh. you know, you gotta, you gotta choose. There's ten people. Like, who can I who can I choose? Don't choose me, choose me. You, know, you chose them last time. No, please, please. Wouldn't that be a scary place? Where's the one? <laughs> exciting place. Being on the team means that we are involved in the game. What do you want people to say about you after you die? Three guys were asked this when they got to heaven. Peter said, okay, guys, what would you, what would you like people to say over you? First guy said, well, I would like them to say I was a great doctor and family friend. The second one said, you know what? I would like them to say I was a great husband and father. And the third guy said, I would like them to say, look, I think he's moving. <laughs> <laughs> a follower of Jesus what would you like people to say about you? that you hardly noticeable you came and sat in the church oh yeah I think she was it. or man were they ever a force for Christ wow I am so I wish we had ten more like them and what's really amazing is when one day you stand before Jesus and he says you are awesome. 
all the things you did, I asked you to do, and you did them. All of heaven, rejoice, for my servant has come home, and I am so pleased with everything that you have done. Last time, I said it was, this is the last time. This is what I hope, that when you get to heaven, God will say about living with you. Yo, angels in heaven, put your hands together for the brothers and sisters of Living Word Church to the glory of God. They are originally out of Langley, B.C., and they rocked the town with good deeds of love in Jesus. Many came to Christ and were brought into the light. Give glory to God in the highest. Archangel, out. <laughs> My prayer is that you will be great. MVP, living word, church people. And that one day you stand before God, he's going to say, wow, you are awesome. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this time, and I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit may have spoken to our hearts. God, this church has so much potential. You, Lord, giving them the power and the wisdom to do things here on 72nd Avenue mainly. I would pray for just a busting forth of numbers of people who will come, of, of your servants here going out into the highways and the byways and, and striving to be the best they can be on Team Jesus. And God bless them, I pray. Bless this place. May it burst at the seams. Thank you that we can be MVPs for you. Jesus. And Lord, I pray for the offering. I just pray, God, that after we watch the video, that you will allow your people to think about their commitment to you. In Jesus' name. So is that okay if we watch the video first, and we'll take the offering?
team Jesus, let's all stand and, and sing Psalm 23. Let this uh, verse be our prayer to be victorious every day. Amen. Amen. gave his best for us in Christ. Will it be proper that we also give our best for him, right? Yes. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of being in your team. It's not by accident. It's a choice. You chose to reveal yourself to us in Christ. You chose to die on the cross that we might be saved. And now, Lord, we are making the decision to choose you as our Lord and Savior that we will serve the 
rest of our life. That only in the middle of the blessed family, even it's the church, may you make us worthy, Lord, to be serving you and to honor you in everything we do the best way we can. And we know, Lord, we cannot do it in ourselves, but by your spirit and by your power and by your grace, we can do it in Jesus' name. And now, Lord, this may such be your blessing as we go through with our respective places. May you make us, Lord, your hands and feet that will serve the people around us. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, bring us with great joy to the only God, our Savior, to Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever and God's people say Amen. Amen God bless you all at this day as we have fellowship and have our EDS after the fellowship thank you and God bless you all